In his new book, Inside the Mind of a Teen Killer, author Phil Chalmers re reveals 15 years of research, including extensive interviews and conversations with some of the country's most notorious teen killers. What led them to kill? Were there warning signs? Can this type of behavior be prevented? Phil Chalmers stopped by our Dedham Studios to talk about his powerful new book. Well, Phil, to start with, uh, Inside the Mind of a Teen Killer, basically, the, I think it's a question everybody asks. What makes these guys do this? Why? What, what did you learn after you uh, decided to delve into this a little bit? Yeah, I, I've been uh, corresponding with these kids for 20 years and uh, interviewing them in depth. And I kind of broke it down into 10 top causes of why. Because everybody asks why. And that's what I asked for many years, why. There are a variety of factors here involved, obviously. Let's talk about a couple of them. Like yeah. One of them we hear a lot about is bullying, especially right. with the Internet now. Right. Number one cause is I call unstable environment. So they either are, they come from an unstable home, mm -hmm. abuse, domestic violence, drugs, or they're bullied at school. That is by far the number one cause of teen murder. And number one cause of school shootings is bullying by landslide. So. Um, uh, violent video games, environment, that type of stuff. We hear a lot about that. How much does that factor That's in? my number two cause, and I kind of stand alone with a couple experts on that. Uh, some people think they kind of poo-poo that whole thing, but I think that violent entertainment, in my research, these kids are fascinated with violent games, violent movies, and violent music. So much so that they actually model some of their crimes after it. They have it tattooed all over their bodies. Uh, it's, it's an important part of their life, and if, if I were to sit you down and you know, make you play Grand Theft Auto for 10 hours, or if I were to sit you down and make you listen to Insane Clown Posse for six yeah, hours, yeah, exactly. you'd walk away saying, I got it. And we've heard people say, well, you know, this person listened to these songs and heard a message or whatever, and we kind of say, oh, come on, give us a break. But this is really, in your conversations with these kids, stuff that they point to that, that has is. led to their... The FBI and I agree that I think it's the pushing point in some kids' lives. But it's a multi-cause crime, so you can't just point to one thing. It's not just Grand Theft Auto. It's not just Hostile 2, the movie. It's a multiple, multitude of, uh, of causes. And usually it's three, four, five, six causes, mm. you know, motivations. kind of pile on there. Now, you did, you, you, as you mentioned, you went in, you talked with these, uh, with these teen killers in prison, face-to-face, -face, you talked to them. What did you take away from those conversations uh, from some of those kids? And, and, and what, you know, alarmed you the most about it? Or what right. did you learn most? Well, um, a lot of the kids that I actually interview face-to-face -to -face are the kids that really have kind of sort of turned their life around and want to help me out. Um, I do correspond through the mail with kids that aren't quite on my mm -hmm. side, you know. Um, what I found out is uh, they're normal-looking kids. They're the kind of kids you would not expect to be killers. If, if I lined them up in a room, you wouldn't be able to pick the killer. Mm -hmm. um, that was the biggest shocking thing, and they, they appeared very normal. But at the same time, uh, one, then once you, you see the person, and you uh, do, the, do the research, you realize that the crimes are heinous and violent. Do they express know. remorse? Are they sorry for what they did? Do they feel justified in what they did? Most of the kids are remorseful. And I think once you get slammed with life without parole, you know you're going to die in prison. It does kind of shake you up a little bit. Um, but most of them I've talked to are remorseful. They know they made a big mistake. And they've decided to kind of lend their support and help to try to reach other kids. One of the things you, you, you talk about in the book is that things parents should do if they want to raise a teen killer, and that's right. what should do. You're taking the whole subject matter, kind of turning it upside down, which calls attention really to the points you're trying to make, and I think it's a very effective Yeah, approach. we have a chapter in the book called 10 Steps to Raising a Teen Killer, yeah. and you know, I tell tongue-in-cheek, if you want to raise a teen killer, here's what you do. You know, yeah. provide an unstable home, uh, allow domestic violence to go on, you know, allow your kids full access to any entertainment they want. It really it comes down to parents are unattentive, and it doesn't matter what uh, kind of financial situation or what neighborhood or what stratosphere parents are from. Uh, you have good parents, bad parents, but for the most part, p parents are unattentive yeah. throughout all, all avenues. And yeah, get uh, involved with your kids and be aware of what they're doing, know who their friends are, all right. that other stuff. Yeah, even the parents that you would we would yeah. call good homes, mm -hmm. they're very busy working. And kids have free access to the Internet, their friends, and every, they get their hands on a lot of things. And lastly here, too, uh, you want to talk to parents about school safety and things they right. should know. What types of things should people, uh, should par what types of questions, I guess, should parents be asking right. at their schools? What I, what I found in my, uh, one of the things I do most is I, I travel the country and train law enforcement and school administrators. And uh, through what I do there is I, I try to give them five steps. And, and I'm, I want to give parents today and grandparents five questions to go to your school and ask. Number one, do we have a school resource officer? Do we have a police officer mm -hmm. assigned to the school all day long? Right. Number two, do we have an anonymous tip line? Can a kid tip someone anonymously because kids don't want to go to the principal or the police? Three, is the school locked down during the day? Can you? I, I walk into a lot of schools just to test them. And I walk right in past the office yeah. into a classroom. Yeah. Um, and then I'll talk about the what is our bullying policy? Do we have a do we have a strong 
bullying policy? And lastly, do we practice lockdown drills? Uh, do you realize that there hasn't been a student dying of a school fire in decades, but we do, we do fire drills every year? We do know kids do die in school shootings. And so, you know, that's kind of stuff I research in the book. I provide my book is a book that you get, read, and take action. And that's kind of what this is about. Not just, you know, celebrating crime or, you know, glorifying or sensationalizing it, but actually let's talk about the issues. And I want to equip people. I, I want people to go to their communities and uh, do something. Because I think this can be stopped. I think it can be stopped. I think we can actually slow it down. But people have to get their heads out of the sand, get out of denial. This could happen in your home. This could happen in your school, in your community. Once we do that, we can actually make a difference.